So I've saved the, the best for last. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. I, <laughs> he likes to be referred to as that Rick Moore, right? Right, right? No, 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 not at all. Rick is my hero. Rick is really, truly my hero. He um, has the only, it's a landmark human rights case in Canada that's put um, has not only helped dyslexic families, but all kinds of disabilities for kids to get uh, help in schools. He originally started a systemic complaint against the, the province, but he only won against the North Vancouver district. And um, his case was 11 years ago. So, um, and his son is now thriving and doing his dream job but I'll let you tell him, or I'll let him tell you exactly what's gone on since his, his, his case. Thanks, Rick. Firstly, I'd just like to say, oh, sorry, these inspiring stories <laughs> have choked me up. Um, in 1997, my son <laughs> uh, was in Kenneth Gordon, a private school specializing in teaching dyslexic kids. And um, he was there because the school psychologist broke all the rules and told us with the closure of the Diagnostic Center in North Vancouver, that if there was any way we could afford to put him in Kenneth Gordon, that was his only chance. Well, many, many promises had been made to us uh, in the public system, but it really amounted to wait and see. Wait and see, and maybe he'll be mature enough someday to learn to read. Um, he developed childhood migraines because of the stress of being in the public school system and, and watching as all his friends learned this magic thing of reading. And, and he, he felt stupid, as all kids that don't have that magic skill do. And um, because he had this, a neurologist said to the school, if you deal with the, the learning difficulties, um, that will likely solve the migraines. So he went from completely off the waiting list for a psych ed to the top of the list. So why is it that a child has to be suffering and damaged to even get on the list? Then he, uh, he got uh, an assessment which showed he was first percentile, severely dyslexic, and he was promised a place at the Diagnostic Center. The Diagnostic Center was shut down because of funding cutbacks, and the school district thought that was the program that should be shut down instead of shutting down other programs that they might have, or at least even looking into the alternatives to shutting down the program. And that's when the school psychologist did this unbelievable thing and said, you should put him in Kenneth Gordon. Well, nothing had worked. And so it was another shot in the dark. But we remortgaged our house and put him in the private school. But something happened within months of him being there. You know, you tell your children when they're in the public school and they can't read that they're, they're very smart. But, of course, they don't believe you because they take a look around at all their, their peers, seeing them able to do this magic thing, and they can't. He gets to the private school, and he sees that actually there are kids just like him who are cool and smart. And... <clears throat> We saw, within months, his self-esteem being rebuilt. And more than his 
a being in a place that knew how to teach him to read, the most important thing, of course, was seeing a self-esteem be rebuilt. So at the end, of, uh, he had to wait a year. So the closure of the diagnostic center was in grade two, couldn't get into the public school, so they essentially babysat him for grade three. And in grade four, he makes this amazing recovery of the self-esteem and is well on his way to learning to read. And when he started grade five, I got really angry, thinking, I'm a bus driver, my wife's a secretary, we've had to remortgage our house. There must be thousands of kids who couldn't do what we managed to do. What about them? And I started phoning around, I called the ombudsman, oh, yeah, it's not really our, our remit. And, but one phone call led to another and led me to clearly legal assistance. And one of the greatest lawyers in the country one of the number one experts in disability law, Francis Kelly, and community legal assistance. Because of course you can't take on the government on your own. You have to find somebody <laughs> pro bono who's gonna. And we actually broke the bank of class. They they wouldn't take they won't take on a, a case like that ever again because it just both bankrupted them. But what Francis was able to do was get us all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. But first, we, uh, it took two years to get to the Human Rights Tribunal because first the commission turned us down because we hadn't appealed to the district, the very people that had cut the program, of course. Um, then we got to, there was a commission at that time, by the way, and I know there is one again now, but one of the things that happened while we were presenting our case was they got rid of the commission, which was supposed to handle the systemic side of the complaint and when they got rid of the commission, we were left to do all of that, the individual complaint and the, and the systemic complaint. Uh, it took five years to present the case. Uh, of course, we were criticized because um, for turning our human rights complaint into a royal commission on education. I guess we actually did. Um, and at the end of the five years, uh, the human rights commission, the tribunal ruled entirely in our favor individual complaint and systemic complaint. And I was in heaven. I thought we had the potential to save the lives of the, the very next generation of dyslexic kids. We eventually got to this. Oh, oh, so anyway, of course, that was appealed. Um, we lost the BC Supreme Court. We got a, 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 a dissenting opinion at the BC Court of Appeal that enabled us to get to the, the Supreme Court of Canada. I really hadn't intended to tell this whole story, but anyway, hard to get me off my soapbox. Um, and what happened was the Supreme Court of Canada is not immune from the controversy of imposing uh, its will on the legislature. And I, I, one thing I learned is courts always do the minimum to put things right. So in the decision, they, they kept the individual win and said that parents in the future can use the precedent to get services for their children just like we were able to get for Jeff. Well, we didn't get services for Jeff, but we did get all the tuition we paid to the private school back and he got damages. And But of course, that's impossible. And it hasn't been possible for families to, to use the precedent. So these kids that are several generations later who are brave enough to come up here and tell their story, it still happens, only it's worse actually than it was in our day because the rule we use uh, uh, have been turned into dead ends. So you go to the Human, uh, Human Rights Commission, you'll be forced into mediation. Uh, you couldn't do a systemic complaint. And not only that, I hate to say it, but the province now feels even more immune and districts feel immune because if some parent does manage to go and get maybe the tuition paid to a private school, and it does happen. That's just the cost of doing business. 
they pay more every year to their lawyers than they do to help one kid. So that's that's my story, and I I I, I feel so emotional hearing these stories because it shouldn't be. My son's n now going to be 37. His dream job, by the way, he's a fireman, the study of North End fireman. So you give people the right resources, their potential's unlimited. I want to say one other thing. One of the things that drove me from the beginning was the fact our kids are totally invisible. There is nothing, you look at these dyslexic kids, they're just beautiful young children. There's nothing that jumps out at you and says, this child is dyslexic, this, uh, this is uh, disabled. So it's easy for them to disappear into the classroom. As a matter of fact, they strive to become invisible in the classroom because they live in terror of being exposed as unable to read. So to bring it to the today, this is not the first time that the ministry has promised to do early screening. I hope, I hope, I pray that this time it's not a, a false mirage for, for the families of dyslexic kids because we just guess at the numbers in the system. And yet we've always had the ability to know exactly how many dyslexic kids there are. If you screen them and identify them in kindergarten or grade one, what, what happens? If you are an ethical governing body, you will track. You will now have identified that child and you will have an obligation to track them. And we will no longer guess. Here's an interesting fact. We know from academic studies that about one in five or 20% of the school kids entering the school system are at risk for reading failure. The dropout rate forever has been about 20%. It should be a pretty simple thing to guess there might be a correlation there. And yet we're content to, and we know, they know from anecdotes from parents that there are kids falling through the cracks in, in the thousands every year. And we're content to let that happen in the public school system. And I, the reason I know this, Jeff has an older cousin nine years older. We hadn't learned how to advocate for that child. She dropped out in grade 10. All the bad things happened to her. She's, it's amazing she's alive. So for every success story, there are countless kids that fell through the cracks that are self-meditating at Maine and Hastings. We're costing this province millions and millions and millions of dollars simply because we don't cheat, teach a child how to, how to read when we, that science of reading is right there. It, it's, it's available. It's not hard to find. It's not going to revolution. It, it's no different teaching a teacher how to do the, 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 learn how to teach reading than it is to teach biology or or PE or something. You just make it part of the university curriculum. Imagine a public school system that actually teaches and knows how to teach kids to read. Thank you so much. And sorry for going on and on and on.